Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to San Antonio. Welcome to the um, spring 2013 um, CNI member meeting. Uh, I'm delighted you've all made it here. Um, I hope that the uh, trip has mostly been easy and not uh, too disrupted by thunderstorms. Uh, but I'm delighted you're here, and I think you're in for a really um, interesting uh, day and a half of sessions. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and let me say before I forget for our new member representatives that I didn't have a chance to uh, meet at um, the uh, introduction for new members today. Um, sorry to miss you, and. Uh, Please, if you have an opportunity, introduce yourself at some point over the uh, course of the meeting um, uh, and um, say hello to me. Uh, the reason I wasn't able to be at the uh, member orientation was we did a double dose of executive roundtables this morning, scholarly identity being a um, very hot topic, it turns out. I'd like to take a moment to welcome our international visitors. Um, international uh, travel these days is not as easy as it used to be, and I appreciate uh, all of you joining us. We have a uh, good representation of colleagues from um, outside the United States who are here with us. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize um, four institutions who have joined or rejoined CNI since our uh, last member meeting. Those are the University of Nevada at Reno, Montana State University, the University of Alberta, and the John Hopkins University Press. Welcome all. <laughs> Um, I will just remind you of a couple of things. We have wireless. If you um, need any help with that, uh, check with the registration desk. There is a message board out there if we have any schedule changes, and thus far at least we have not had any. Um, we will post them out there. And um, the meeting rooms are actually on two levels, the level you're on and then um, on the side of the hotel immediate, on the ground level, not the, um, not the river walk level, but the ground level, like where taxis drop you off, um, uh, immediately underneath us. So we are split across two floors here. Um, and there is a map in the, um, in the uh, meeting program of the uh, meeting rooms if you have any trouble finding things. With that said for introduction, I am going to move immediately on to our speaker. Um, we have a very special plenary talk for you today and um, I am just so pleased that Herbert was um, willing to do considerable violence to his personal schedule to um, join us here to do this because I think that there's a lot of important stuff in this talk and a tremendous amount of food for thought for all of us. Um, Herbert von de Sample, I know is well known to all of you. He's had um, an amazingly distinguished career. He has done all kinds of things. Um, you'll find his name associated with a uh, substantial number of the most important uh, projects in networked information over the last um, 10 or 15 years. And um, you can read his biography on the, um, on the web. Um, I'm not going to take you through it. Um, I will say on a personal note that many years ago, I was very privileged to be part of a special committee that was put together to um, review his uh, PhD thesis. Um, that was a, a, a wonderful moment and a special treat. And um, of course, I've followed his work even before then and um, have indeed had the privilege of working with him um, uh, on a few of these projects, at least in a very modest kind of advisory role. So I'm going to just turn the podium over right now to 
Herbert, who is going to um, give you a, a very high level and I think very thought provoking um, reflection on a lot of the developments we've seen over the past decade and where they are likely to take us. Welcome. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Cliff, for uh, your kind words. Looking at the size and caliber of the audience, I'm now thinking I should have stayed on my road trip in Utah and Arizona. <laughs> I'm going to start with uh, uh, two apologies, actually. Uh, the first one is to those of you who were at the IDCC meeting in Amsterdam uh, a couple weeks ago, because there's going to be significant overlap with the presentation uh, I did there. And um, the Second apology is uh, about the fact that this talk will be a, mit, a bit more technical than uh, you can expect of a regular plenary talk, but I guess Cliff was aware of that uh, when he invited me, so uh, here we are. There is something magical about CNI meetings in San Antonio, Texas for me, uh, because 13, about 13 years ago, I did the first plenary uh, talk here uh, in a hotel not too far from here, actually. In that talk, I actually presented about the protocol for metadata harvesting, which I'll touch upon in a bit also. Uh, it had just been released or was about uh, to be released officially. And in the second part of that talk, I basically looked at new capabilities that the digital networked environment was offering us to transform scholarly communication, to implement the core functions of scholarly communication in a different way. So I'm talking about registration, uh, certification, awareness, archiving, and rewarding. And how all these things, or a lot of these things, had been implemented in a vertically integrated way in the journal system, and how the digital environment was allowing us to rethink how these were implemented and start to think about implementing in a more modular uh, kind of manner. None of this has really happened, uh, but here we are. We are starting to see some signs out there, especially with less traditional materials, of uh, more modular implementations of the various uh, functions of scientific communication. <clears throat> Call me lazy. It took me four years to write down the ideas that I had presented uh, in that plenary address in this paper uh, that got published in DLIP magazine. I co-authored it with a couple of friends from uh, Cornell University, including Sandy Piet, Carla Gozzi, and uh, Simeon Warner. And so, again, this paper looked at fundamental changes that were happening in scholarly communication, this ability to implement the functions of scholarly communication in a modular uh, kind of way, but it also observed something that was changing about the nature of the assets that were being communicated in the scholarly system. And said that we're starting to move away from only communicating by means of PDFs or monographs. And we're starting to introduce a whole range of less traditional assets in e-science and e-humanities endeavors. And I'm obviously talking about data sets and software, ontologies, workflows, slides, blogs, and what have you not. And my talk today will really be about these kind of materials and two core characteristics that distinguish them from the kind of materials that we were used to in the traditional scholarly communication system. On the one hand, these kind of materials are not atomic anymore, like a scholarly article was. Rather, you know, they are all kind of different components that really belong together. They're different parts that all relate to the same research endeavor, and that one way or another, one needs to bundle up. And that leads us to the notion of grouping assets that have a wide range of relationships and dependency as on each other. The other core characteristic is that, unlike the PDFs, that had a very strong sense of fixity, journal articles had a very strong sense of fixity, these kind of materials don't really have that. And they are continuously in motion, or at least for part of their lifetime, are in motion. 
And this leads us to the notion of versioning assets and how to go about doing that. And so I'll talk about two technologies that I was involved in devising that try to address some of the challenges that relate to these two uh, characteristics. One is uh, ORE, OAI, ORE, Object Reuse and Exchange. That stands for, that is about grouping assets. And the other is Memento, that is about versioning assets. But before I go there, as promised at the outset, I'm going to go back to the protocol for metadata harvesting. And the reason I'm doing that is to point out the fundamental change that our perception of the web infrastructure has undergone in the past 15 years. So first of all, the Open Archives Initiative, if you may remember, was a heroic effort to try and fundamentally change scholarly communication. So we basically said, let's start communicating by means of preprints, by means of non-reviewed uh, literature, and in doing so, basically subvert the existing uh, scholarly communication system uh, by established uh, commercial uh, journals. Again, that didn't happen, but out of this effort, at least came a couple of interesting uh, technologies. So OAI uh, looked at this problem domain from a technical perspective. <clears throat> And it said, in order to make this dream happen of communicating via preprints, we are going to have to make them more easily to discover, more easy to use and uh, reuse. Now, the way we went about achieving this goal is actually utterly interesting. <clears throat> so first of all, we looked at this as a problem of metadata exchange. You need to remember this is 1998 when we start to uh, tackle that problem. And in those days, a lot of digital libraries held metadata, but not necessarily the content described by the metadata. We were still in the phase of uploading uh, digital assets, digitizing existing materials, and so on. The other consideration here was that most of the search engines that existed in those days were mainly focused on indexing HTML materials and not necessarily PDFs. So hence this notion of, okay, let's focus on exchange of metadata. Second component that is interesting to observe. If one were to tackle the problem of exposing, making discoverable preprints today, you would obviously come at it from the perspective of search engine optimization you would go out of your way to make sure that Googles and the likes would easily find your materials. Well, we did not do so. Rather, we had this whole notion of data providers at the red hand side that would expose their metadata, and then service providers would just pop out uh, of nowhere, and they would start to create all kinds of interesting services based on the exposed metadata. What is really going on here is the fact that at the moment in time that we devised the protocol, we did not consider search engines to be an integral part of the web infrastructure. We just did not look at them that way, which is very different with the situation today. Third aspect, and from my perspective, one of the most interesting ones, <clears throat> is purely technical. So, Again, this is 1998, and obviously HTTP exists, and the web is starting uh, to bloom. But what exactly HTTP means, and what exactly the web infrastructure means, is not yet very clear to us. At that moment, Roy Fielding had not yet published his thesis about the REST principles. The web architecture had only been defined in 2004, so that was like six years later uh, than when we started this effort. And so these whole notions that are now core to the web architecture, resources, URIs that identify resources, representations of resources, were not known to us yet. And so here we are with a fuzzy understanding of what the web really means, and we're devising this protocol. And so just look at uh, the first part there. There's something wrong uh, with this slide here. Uh, I'm kind of losing my background. <clears throat> but the first part here basically says, we're defining a protocol in the abstract. And then we're going to tell you how to instantiate it on HTTP. So what this really says is, we're not trusting HTTP. Remember, we had just lost Gopher, and we were recovering from that. And now we didn't trust 
that HTTP was going to you know, stay alive for five or 10 years. So we define the protocol in the abstract and say, okay, let's now show the people how to do that in HTTP. The second one shows a request for a metadata record. And you see the verb in there, verb equals get record. So get me this thing. Well, today you would do that simply by an HTTP get on the metadata record. You wouldn't put a, get ver uh, a verb get record in there. Same thing with this notion of an incomplete list. So in the protocol for metadata harvesting, you have the notion that a server can send a huge uh, list back to, uh, to the client, too big for the client to consume. So what do we do? We introduce a paging mechanism so that the client can get these, this large list uh, piecemeal. The way that is implemented is by means of a token. The server sends a token to the client, and in the follow-up request, the client resubmits that token, and the server gives back the second part or the next part of the incomplete list. Clearly, something one would implement today by means of a link, as is done in the Atom protocol. All of this to say that in those days, the web infrastructure was not very well known. We didn't really understand what was going on. And when tackling interoperability problems, what we really did is we were piggybacking on the web infrastructure. We said, okay, of course we're going to use HTTP because everyone is using it now, but we were still defining interoperability as something between those two parties up there, leaving all the rest you know, of parties that were on the web out of the interoperability game. So the action radius of the interoperability defined in this kind of way was relatively small. Let me get back to those two technologies that I mentioned are addressing these challenges related to the emerging compoundness of scholarly assets and then later on uh, the versioning of assets. <clears throat> so the first one is OAI uh, ORE. And the consideration there is that scholarly assets are no longer atomic but are becoming compound and consist of multiple resources with a variety of relationships and interdependencies. And then the question that ORE tries to answer is, how are we going to convey this compoundness in a machine actionable kind of manner? How are we going to say these resources are part of this compound object and these uh, out there are not? In order to motivate the problem, it's actually enough to look at a very simple uh, example, which is a splash page, in this case here from uh, the physics archive. And what you see going on here is already this compoundness. So it starts off with the splash page, right? And the splash page has its own identifier. Now that's not the identifier of the assets themselves, because those are the postscripts, PDFs, etc., that are listed here. There's several versions available of this thing, several identifiers pertaining to this thing, and relationships with all kinds of objects. So you look at this as a human, and of course you understand what's going on. We can interpret this stuff. A machine cannot. And so RE was about how are we going to express to a machine that you know, this part here, this is all part of the object, and this is actually not part of the object. These are just relationships between the objects and other kind of things that are outside of the object. We started this endeavor in a way, and we're now talking 2006, in a way that is extremely similar to how we approach the PMH uh, problem. So you recognize the similarity, I hope, with the picture I've shown you earlier. You have here, let's say, the repositories that are the data providers, and here you have a service provider, and these thingies here are the compound objects, and then we would have interfaces in front of these repositories, not only a harvest interface, but also an obtain, which is an HTTP get, of course, and a put, which is an HTTP put. So we looked at the problem, again, from a repository-centric uh, kind of way. Fast forward the clock with less than a year, and suddenly this entire perspective has fundamentally changed. And rather than looking at this problem of compoundness from the perspective of repositories or digital libraries, we're looking at it from the perspective of the web graph. And suddenly we say, well, in the end, all these resources that make up a compound object, 
they reside on the web. And the problem that we really need to tackle is how to express that these resources here belong together, and that these resources belong together, and that these ones belong together. And so basically, how do we add information to the web graph that says that these things uh, are connected, related, and belong uh, together? The other thing that's going on here, and you see that in the title, is that we now start to really embrace the fact that web crawlers and hence search engines are an integral part of the infrastructure. So you start to look at this interoperability problem from a very different perspective. And suddenly, we are no longer talking about compound objects in digital repositories. We're talking about aggregations of web resources. And the solution that is being proposed to tackle the challenge is just publish a machine-readable document out there that states that these things belong together, that they, they are related to each other, and so on. Once you take that fundamental shift of no longer looking at the problem from a repository perspective, but from a web perspective, you suddenly have an arsenal of concepts, well-defined concepts and tools at your disposition to start and tackle uh, the problem. Obviously, these from the architecture of the World Wide Web, the primitives, a resource, a resource identified by URI, and the resource has a representation. So these are tools that we can work with to define and solve our problem. And then if we're going to talk to machines and convey information to machines, we're going to use the resource description framework. By the way, I highly recommend the presentation that Rob Sanderson will do about this uh, later this, uh, this afternoon, I think. So RDF, you arise again, of course, and vocabularies to help solve your specific problem. So these are the tools of the trade now. And what you see, at the end of two years of thinking and working hard on this problem of compoundness, the solution is as simple as what you see depicted here. At the right-hand side, you see these resources, and to some, for someone, these seem to belong together. Three resources with their URIs. So what you're doing is you introduce a new resource into the web graph, and that web graph, that uh, resource has its own identifier and stands for the union of these. And then we say, okay, we are now going to put out a document on the web that describes exactly what you see here. It states that there is this resource that is an aggregation, and it aggregates these things. And this document is published on the web for crawlers and applications to discover. So it comes from a completely different perspective than repositories. This is a solution completely embedded in the web architecture. <clears throat> so there's a fundamental shift here in the thinking. For me, this was a very big moment in my career, as a matter of fact, to be able to make that shift away from thinking about problems in terms of digital libraries and thinking, starting to think of them in terms of the web architecture and the tools that the web gives us. I know for other people that were involved in this effort, it was a similar uh, eye-opener. So you use the notions that are defined in the web architecture, resource URI representations, as the tool of the trade. And suddenly, by doing that, you get de facto integration with other web applications, and you get the potential of adoption beyond the community that you initially devised the solution for. This, as a matter of fact, has happened. ORE was conceived from the perspective of scholarly communication, and we see it now being adopted in cultural heritage kind of environments like Europeana and the Digital Public Library uh, of uh, America. ORE is one of the highly used vocabularies now in the linked data environment. And that's all of the result of taking the shift towards uh, web architecture. What brought it home for me that we were on the right track here was an experiment that I did with my team in 2007. It is described in uh, the paper that you see cited at the bottom there. What we did is we ran a simulation, basically. And we pretended that there were two publishers of aggregations, of compound objects out there. And we said, well, these aggregations consist of web resources, and resources on the web, they change. And that means that the aggregations change. And as a matter of fact, they change in two different ways. 
on the one hand, existing resources can leave an aggregation and new resources can enter an aggregation. And on the other hand, the resources that are part of the aggregation can themselves evolve over time. And so we're thinking, well, well, how are we even going to know? So there's this aggregation. How are we going to know what this thing looked like at a certain moment in time? How are we going to be able to look back at that? Well, the only thing we had to do was take existing tools, web archiving tools and web crawling tools, so Heractrix and the Wayback Machine, basically, to archive these aggregations and the aggregated resources. Just using existing tools and infrastructure. And doing that, we were able to look back at the state of these aggregations as they changed over time. All of that was given to us for free because we have used the tools of the web interoperability trade. We could just use off-the-shelf technologies to uh, deal with this problem. Going back to the little picture I've shown you before, this is how I would characterize this new perspective on interoperability. <clears throat> These two parties up there need to interoperate. And rather than saying, well, we're going to piggyback on the web infrastructure and we're going to interoperate with each other, they now interoperate with the web infrastructure itself directly. And that, of course, suddenly opens up the action radius of your interoperability effort very significantly because all these parties at the bottom that also leverage the web infrastructure now become in scope, become potential adopters of whatever you have done. It's not only technology that presents challenges when you deal with this kind of aggregations, compound uh, objects. As a matter of fact, what is really going on here is what well, this example that I gave you of the splash page with the physics archive is actually not the very best example because in that uh, case, basically all the resources that are being aggregated are part of the same repository. In many cases, that is not true of these compound objects. And as a matter of fact, there's a repository that mints an aggregation, but the aggregated resources live in a wide variety of environments. And they, you know, these environments operate under very different regimes, technically, legally, socially, et cetera, et cetera. And so you start to deal with these challenges of, well, what does stewardship of such a compound object even mean in an environment where all the components of your object are distributed in these different environments. And what does access and access right mean? How meaningful is an aggregation when each of these components have different access rights? Does that even make sense? Or should all of these resources be under the same kind of license, hopefully a liberal uh, kind of access license? This reminds me of a very similar kind of challenge that you see in the linked data environments. There people are reaching the conclusion that when you're going to merge different linked data sets, it's not enough that they're available under a liberal uh, Creative Commons license. As a matter of fact, they'd better be available all under the same license and hopefully even the CC0, because then you can really merge and really leverage uh, the result of the merging of your content. Enough about ORE, I'm now going to move on to uh, Memento. Memento is all about the web and time. So there's clear roots of Memento in the experiment I described earlier, where we looked at these evolving aggregations. And as a matter of fact, most likely, if we had not done that experiment related to ORE, about seeing how these aggregations evolve over time, maybe we would never have ended up with uh, the Memento concept. So the consideration here is that when you have a resource uh, on the web, and that resource is, of course, identified by URI, at any moment in time, it is only possible to obtain the representation of the current state of that resource. Okay? So you dereference a URI, you get back what that resource is about at this very moment in time. That introduces the question of, well, what if we have representations of prior states of that resource, so archived states? How are we going to access those? 
And that's exactly what Memento looks at. It looks at this from the perspective of the web uh, in general. But I'm going to try and convince you in the next 10 or 15 minutes that Memento also has consequences for scientific communication. And that is in this realm of scholarly assets that do not have the same sense of fixity like PDFs and so on have. And they are continuously on the move, changing under our feet, basically. And even the traditional assets, like journal articles that we know so well, even those are already now becoming much more dynamic than was the case in the past. Simplest example, it suffices, again, to just look at the splash page and how dynamic and changing over time these have become. They've become very rich environments that give all kinds of information pertaining to the assets described on the splash page where they used to only describe a little bit of metadata about that resource. Take it a little step further and you start you know, going into publishing in open peer review and open commentary environments. And now you see that an author submits a first version that is openly accessible. There's some commentary, next version, commentary again, etc. And even that journal article, you know, that article starts to evolve uh, over time. Same thing with web native authoring of scholarly papers. This example here from uh, Autorea, uh, uh, very recently launched and created by Alberto Pepe, who was uh, on my team for a brief while. Here, built into this environment where scholars can basically write their papers in a web browser, is this whole notion of versioning of resources, the mere fact that these things will not be stable but will evolve over time and can be shared with colleagues or with uh, the web at large. These are just examples of traditional kind of materials. You take it to the other extreme and you arrive in this world that was described fantastically last year in the keynote by Carol Goebel from uh, Manchester University. So this is the realm of scientific uh, workflows. And what you see here at the left-hand side is a, a workflow that is being submitted to the My Experiment environment. And this workflow actually calls upon services that are listed in uh, the BIA catalog, service registry. Those services themselves actually call databases that sit behind uh, each of those. The workflow is executed on a workflow uh, engine. This is an example of things that are not only continuously in motion, but also highly interdependent on uh, each other. Workflow change over time. Service descriptions change over time, as does the database that sits behind them. The workflow engine software changes over time. The operating system that sits underneath changes over time. So this is all continuously in flux. This leads to the problem that when you run a workflow today and you run it three weeks from now, you'll get different results. And that is the problem now commonly known as reproduci the reproducibility of in silico signs. I'm not going to go there because that's uh, not my expertise. The, the point here is, however, that when you have results coming out of running in such environments, you will need to know what the state of these resources, of these interdependent things were in order to be able to accurately interpret those results. So you will need to know what was the state of this complex system when I ran it at that moment in time, what was the state then, et cetera, et cetera. To summarize, the whole notion of fixity of scholarly communication assets is seriously challenged. We are dealing with assets that are continuously evolving, and that makes us to have to embrace, basically, the notion of the state of the scholarly record at a specific moment in time, and hence the title of my presentation that is about the move from what we know as the version of record to a version of the scholarly record. And essentially, we will have the need to look at interdependent related assets that evolve over time and be able to determine what the state of these assets was at specific uh, moment in time. 
And this is actually where uh, Memento comes in. So I'm going to give you a little uh, description about Memento so that you would understand later on <clears throat> how it can help in tackling uh, this uh, very significant challenge. Two perspectives I'll give you on Memento. The first thing that you see here is um, a CNN homepage from uh, the day of the September, so the September 11 attacks. And this comes out of the web archive. <clears throat> and the observation here is that this resource, which is an archived resource, has this URI here. And we call that URI M for Memento. We call this thing a Memento. And that's a specific uh, URI for this uh, version. And then we have another resource, URIR, which is CNN.com, where you would have the current version of the CNN.com homepage. So the archived version at a specific moment in time has a specific URI, and there's a generic URI from which at any moment in time the current representation is available. Similar situation in content management systems uh, like wikis. Here you see the, first, the very first page in Wikipedia about the September 11 attacks. And you see the same pattern. Uh, you, we have a URI M that is a URI, an identifier for this specific version. And then you have a generic URI from which at any moment in time you can obtain the current version of uh, that resource. I will depict this, and there's going to be a lot of these kind of pictures from now on, so you better kind of uh, get used to them. <laughs> so we have uh, time uh, as it evolves here, and what we see here is different mementos, and basically there's a, a resource for every version. And what we see, we, Tim Berners-Lee calls these time-specific resources, and it says here that the M0 memento is alive from time zero to time one, and then from time one to time two, we have this one, time two to time three, we have this one. So these are version-specific uh, URIs. And then you have the notion of a time generic resource, and that's basically the one at the bottom, and that's the one from which at any moment in time, you can obtain the current version. So if we look at it today, let's say we obtain this version, if you looked at it at T1, we get this one, which would have been the same content as this. At T0, zero, time zero, this one here, that would have been the same as this. This was not invented by Memento. It has, you know, this is a pattern that you see all over the web. Memento just leverages uh, this pattern. <clears throat> here is an example taken from uh, the architecture of uh, the World Wide Web document. And what you see here is, uh, the latest version, here is the URI for the latest version, will always be available at this URI. This version, so the current version, also has a version-specific URI, and the previous version is at this URI. So that's the pattern that I was just describing. And so for Memento, the question now becomes, given this kind of pattern of version-specific URIs and a generic URI, how do I get from this generic URI to a version that was available at a certain moment in time? Why would it be of interest to be able to do that? Well, because this URI at the bottom here, this generic URI, that's the one I'm going to send you in an email. And that's the one that I'm going to bookmark. And if we talk about scholarly communication, that's the one that I'm going to put in a reference, as a matter of fact, probably with a date stamp next to it, like as accessed on this date. And so that would lead us to wanting to use this generic URI to reference the resource a long time, alongside with the time indication, and then we would try to go from here, basically, to an appropriate version of the resource. And this is actually exactly what Memento does. And it achieves this, again, by leveraging the primitives of the web architecture resource, URI, state representation, link, and as a matter of fact, also content negotiation. So here's how it works, and I'm not going to go in a lot of technical detail. The consideration is that this resource and these version resources may reside on different systems, as is the case 
with web archives. So CNN.com lives here, and the web archives that have old versions of CNN.com, they sit up there. So this resource down here doesn't really know about the details of the past, the archived versions that uh, live in another system. But what we say is, well, there is a resource. This system clearly knows about all of these mementos. So we're introducing a resource that actually is aware of the past of that one. And we allow navigation from the generic resource to this new resource, which we call a time gate. So that time gate knows about the past of this resource. So a client, a web client, can now follow that link to the time gate. And there, it uses content negotiation in the daytime dimension to obtain an appropriate version. So meaning the version that was active at a certain moment in time. For those who are not aware of this, content negotiation is built into the HTTP protocol. It is something that your browser does all the time. It will express a preference, in our case, of English over French, of HTML over PDF. It just provides this information as it talks to a server, and if the server can honor these preferences, it will actually do it. HTTP defines content negotiation for a couple of dimensions, including language and media type, and we introduce it for daytime. So that's exactly what's going on here. To cut a long story short, what Memento allows you to do is look at a website as it is today, and that's the, CNN, uh, the CNI.org page of today. You use a browser that is equipped with a Memento-compatible tool. You select the daytime of the past, and automatically the protocol will lead you to an appropriate version of that page of around the date you selected. Not necessarily exactly the date that you selected, because that may just not be available in any web archives. So what you get back is obviously subject to what is available out there in the archives. But that's basically what Memento allows you to do. So now back to this whole notion of fixity is challenged, and can we reconstruct the state of you know, these interdependent and interrelated assets as they were at a certain moment in time. So here we go again with one of these pictures. So I see timeline here, and what we have here now are two resources that are interdependent and related, and they are progressing over time. And what I'm saying here is, well, let's talk first about the simple case. It's a discrete progression. This basically means these are more or less traditional scholarly communication assets, and there are humans involved in deciding, you know, oh yeah, there was enough change to this version, let's now mint a new version. And you know, there's a board of directors that says, oh yeah, yeah, this one, oh look at this, there's a substantial change here, let's create another version. So we have this human kind of decision making in minting new versions of this resource. Well, if these versions would reside on systems that are Memento compatible, then I could exactly recreate the state of these interdependent resources as they were at time i. Because I used the Memento protocol to dereference each of these URIs subject to time, and I actually arrive in this case here at this URI, and in this case at this URI, and basically I know that at ti, this one and this one belong together. So I've kind of connected them uh, back in time there. But what about when there is no such thing as editorial control and people that sit there and decide there is a new version available? So there is kind of a more continuous progression of these resources. How, in that case, are we going to reconstruct the state of that system? So let's look at the specific uh, case of that. <clears throat> And we're going to look at the case of a paper that references other resources. And we're going to see whether we can reconstruct the cited context of this paper as it was at the moment that that paper was actually cited. So we have a special case of the general problem that I was describing. The ti time i is the time of publication, and the relationship between these resources is that they were all cited by the same thing. 
And the paper I'm going to use is the one that I talked about uh, earlier. So here we go. This is the reference list. And this paper was published on September 15, 2004. So what we would like to see is for these URIs that are being referenced here, for there to be an archived copy of these things around the time uh, of publication. So let's look at the first one. Uh, there's something going wrong here. I don't know what it is. But it's uh, a paper by, actually, it's the Cyber Infrastructure Report by uh, Dan Atkins. We dereference that URI. Not only uh, is that resource no longer available, that domain doesn't even exist anymore. This was a fundamental report on cyber infrastructure, uh, by the way. We now use uh, Memento, and we arrive at the copy of that resource in a web archive from uh, December 5, 2003. So not very close to the daytime of publication of the citing paper, but something uh, nevertheless. The second one up is a paper by the people from Southampton. Uh, and the current version, as a matter of fact, still exists in their institutional repository. We use Memento, and we find an archived version very close, actually, to the daytime of publication of the citing paper. <clears throat> Third one up is actually um, a paper by Cliff Lynch about institutional repositories. It's one that was put out on the uh, ARL, in the ARL series. We dereference that URI, and it's gone. Yeah, this is ARL for you. <laughs> and then, fortunately, with Memento, we find an archived copy of the end of 2003. <clears throat> and then the last one I think I'm looking at is a paper by uh, Sandy Payette and Tony Staples. This is about the Mellon Fedora project. The resource is gone when we dereference it, so there's nothing there anymore. And unfortunately, uh, there's nothing in web archive, so Memento doesn't find it back either. All of this is, of course, uh, anecdotal evidence. Rob Sanderson uh, led an experiment, a pilot study, about how this is you know, in real life by looking at uh, URIs that are uh, listed in reference lists, but also in the body of text of the archive and in uh, UNT uh, repositories. Basically, he looked at does the reference resource still exist? Are there archived versions of the reference uh, resource? And if so, are there archived resources from around the time of the publication of the citing paper? The findings are very similar to what I showed you in the anecdotal evidence. And so there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that despite there not being any kind of proactive effort to archive these referenced resources, some of them, actually quite a considerable number of them, were found in web archives. Why is that? Because there is continuous web archiving going on. There's just these processes. Web archives are sending these, their crawlers out. And because resources have URIs, they get archived for free. So this accidental archiving that comes for free in the web infrastructure. The other observation that I'd like to make here, we saw that Memento enables us to find resources back even if they currently do not longer exist and hence respond with the 404. This makes me ask the question, if we consider web archives to be part of the web infrastructure, and we add Memento as a protocol to the mix. Does that make HTTP URIs potential candidates for persistent identifiers? The bad news coming out of both the anecdotal evidence and the experiment that Rob did is that many resources were not archived, and for very few resources were there archived copies from around the time of publication. <clears throat> so to summarize, going back to our picture, yes, to a certain extent, we were able to recreate the state of these interdependent resources at a certain moment in time, but to a large extent, we were not. We were able to do so due only to accidental archiving. That tells me basically that probably we should start to become more proactive in archiving 
these continuously evolving resources that are now part of the scholarly record. And how to do that? And who is going to do that? And when are we going to do that? Would actually be subject to a very interesting uh, conversation. There's lots of options. The resources can be self-archiving. For example, if you use a content management system, uh, a wiki, a data wiki, with solid versioning mechanisms, then as a matter of fact, you know, these things get act uh, actively archived as they change over time. Transactional web archives are another solution. Transactional web archives basically save a copy of every representation that is delivered uh, to a client. You can rely on resource archiving via web archives, as was shown in the example, accidental archiving. So you basically do nothing. You sit back and you relax. And some of your resources will actually get archived. Or you can have an on-demand archiving kind of approach where you subscribe to a web archiving service that comes in and regularly crawls your environment. You can think of archiving resources at significant moments in their life cycle. For example, when I submit a paper or when I publish a paper, we're going to collect all the reference resources and archive those. Or you can think about archiving resources at the moment they are being interacted with after they are being put out there. For example, when there's social network interaction with them, when they are being downloaded, annotated, and so on. A lot of options, as I said, and a lot of food uh, for thought and debate. Cliff, how much more time do I have? OK, seven, yeah. <clears throat> so I talked an awful lot about technology and machines. And I want to end on a more human note. <clears throat> and I want to observe that not only did the scholarly communication system change by means of the kind of materials that are added to it and their characteristics, but as a matter of fact, the way the contributors to the scholarly communication system uh, exist and the very nature has changed also. They are coming basically, and I'll show you a couple slides. They used to be in the periphery, as I see it, of the scholarly record, and they're now taking central web stage. And this is enabled by online identities that these contributors are getting in various portals and social networks. They make contributions by depositing assets in these kind of social networks. And I don't mean necessarily Twitter or Google Plus when I talk about social networks. I'm also talking about things like uh, SlideShare and Figshare and GitHub and what have you not. And so we have these portals that then link the assets that are being contributed with the contributor identity. And in doing so, one can now start to derive metrics pertaining to these contributed assets and hence also pertaining to the contributor. And so if I were to characterize the previous environment, it would be like this. We had really the journals at the center stage and they had their ISSN numbers and UIs, what have you not, and articles get published in journals, and oh yeah, there's actually authors for these, look at that. And you know, they actually were identified by their very ambiguous names, right? And they derived all their credit indirectly, as a matter of fact, very indirectly from things like impact factors computed at the level of journals, not at the level of things they really contributed. And you fast forward, and suddenly, there's a big shift. Suddenly we see our contributors at the center identified in different environments with HTTP URIs, with ORCID identifiers, what have you not. They interact in social environments. They create all kinds of assets that live in a wide variety of portals. And you know what? They actually can get credit for each of these contributions because all of these environments are actually counting and creating metrics about what these people are contributing. So it's a fundamental shift of how the contributors reside in this new web-based scholarly communication system. This was actually observed as one of the big trends, one of the seven uh, predictions for the future of research in this uh, document by uh, Jiskin Form 
researchers fully embrace uh, social media. And again, by social media, we are not only talking about Twitter, but also all these environments in which people are submitting uh, scholarly assets. <clears throat> this leads me to the notion of surface your scholars. And this, of course, is a bit of a paraphrase to what Lorcan, Dun uh, uh, Lorcan Dempsey is always talking about when he talks about the inside-outside uh, library. He talks about surfacing library materials to the web. So what I'm talking about here is basically institutions that should really surface their scholars in these environments. <laughs> they should actively promote that their scholars are taking uh, active part in these professional, academic, asset-oriented portals, such as LinkedIn, Mendeley, SlideShare, MyExpere, and GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. The reason being that that will increase not only the visibility of these scholars, but also the visibility of these institutions. It will not only give us more metrics about the scholars, it will give us more metrics about their institutions, because eventually, all these metrics will be aggregated to the level of their departments and their institutions, just like they were with the impact factor. The same thing will happen with these alternative metrics that we see pop out all over the place now. This reminds me of a paper I came across recently by colleagues from the University of Sydney. What they did here is they basically created a ranking of universities worldwide purely by looking at DBpedia link structure of a university and the people that have studied at the university, the kind of degrees they got, the kind of awards they got, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> purely looking at the two degree link structure of these Wikipedia, DBpedia pages and the types of link relationships, they obtain a ranking of institutions that is, as a matter of fact, highly correlated with the existing ones coming out of the Times Higher Education and the one that I'm going to blank the name on that comes out of China. Purely looking at open data, purely looking at web-based information and a little bit of smart uh, computation. Okay, I'm going to uh, round up. Basically, what I did is I looked at a 15-year uh, evolution. And in those 15 years, we have gone from a very fuzzy understanding of the web infrastructure to a true understanding of what the web really means. We have gone from a notion of not really knowing how to deal with interoperability in the web to fundamentally leverage the web infrastructure in our interoperability efforts. In that same time period, we have moved from a scholarly communication system that was based on a stack of journals and a bunch of PDF files to a network of interconnected assets and actors. What I've tried to show you by means of ORE and Memento is that it is actually possible to tackle fundamental challenges related to the new scholarly communication environment by leveraging the web infrastructure and its primitives. Other efforts that I'm, relate, uh, that I'm involved in, like resourcing and open annotation, are actually going along exactly the same path. If we can do it for these efforts and for the challenges they tackle, I dare say that probably we can do it for a lot of other challenges that we face in scholarly communication, such as certification, archiving, persistence, trust, metrics, and what have you not and try to leverage the web infrastructure to tackle those challenges also. The wins are obvious, long-term sustainability, because you're going to use technologies and tools that are widely used by others around you. And at a more philosophical level, we'll achieve a tight integration of the scholarly discourse with other web-based uh, discourse that happens out there. Now, with your permission, I would like to go back to this. But maybe that's time for a few questions, Cliff. <clears throat> Thank you. We have time, it seems, for one or two questions. Um, 
thank you very much, uh, particularly for uh, talking about how our way of, of looking at this world has changed and um, our, our new kind of concepts, and, and also for your, your work on Memento, which I really feel is groundbreaking, very interesting. Um, can you speculate on how one might extend some of the things you're talking about into other areas that uh, are, I, at least in my view, quite problematic. Uh, for example, um, I mean, you're talking about material once it is out on the open web. There, uh, one big problem we have now is that the versions of someone's book or manuscript or whatever, uh, uh, we only get the last version don't get the previous versions. Those are not on the open web, but they may actually be on the web. Uh, uh, sure. you know, and they're shared by people. You know, I write something, uh, I put it up, I share it with others. Um, is there some way we could leverage with file naming, with other things, to uh, kind of extend it into that area? Okay, <clears throat> I think I understand the question, uh, which in essence is about <clears throat> Resources get minted, and they evolve over time, but not necessarily is that entire evolution publicly visible. Some of it may be, and some of it may not be. If I would answer this question from the memento perspective, I would say that the memento concepts still hold, irrespective of the fact whether some of these things are not visible and some are visible. The problem becomes, of course, one, and I see uh, David right behind you, of access rights and how to deal with that. And as you know, in a lot of efforts, uh, we have this notion of separation of concerns. So you first tackle one problem, and then you say, well, authorization and authentication, that's for someone else. OK, so, but there's no need not to look at repository, uh, sorry, at um, resources that reside in a closed environment in the same way as you look at them in an open environment. The same versioning mechanisms, the same HTTP URI schemes, the same notions of memento data and negotiation could apply. The question becomes one of access rights. And that should be, or at least in my perspective, is orthogonal to the versioning and the memento protocol as such. So if you have access rights to that resource that sits behind the firewall, then you will actually get there. If not, you'll get a nasty uh, kind of error message probably just as it is out there currently. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So that's why, but probably I went a bit fast. <clears throat> um, this whole notion of trying to do that not in a human mediated way, but in a machine mediated way, and hence my suggestion to start thinking about using content management system with strong versioning mechanisms, wikis, data wikis, because those will automatically take care of all of that. And if then you want to make those memento compliant, it's about you know, basically developing a plugin for that system, and you have the whole uh, memento approach uh, at your fingertips also. So there are systems that can help you with doing that. David, are you going to hurt me again? No, no. Uh, uh, Herbert and I actually disagree a little bit about that, although I agree with most of what it, I, what I wanted to do was to, um, <clears throat> a lot of the enthusiasm about the revolution in, the, in the scientific communication is about uh, metrics, and you brought that up, and that's very important. And one of the lessons, of, uh, you know, I've worked at three successful startups, one of the lessons is that management likes to measure stuff because then they can improve it. And what they end up doing is gaming the system. And uh, I want to draw attention to a wonderful paper by Brems and Munaf called Deep Impact, Unintended Consequences of Journal Ranking. What they basically show is that gaming the system is uh, endemic. Uh, High-ranking journals are quite strong predictors of malpractice in various ways. And the reason is that people are gaming the system. And 
the caution that I want to put out there is actually their argument applies to any form of ranking at all, including all these metrics that people are getting so enthusiastic about. What we're going to do is to transform one kind of gaming the system into another kind of gaming the system. And we have the awful warning out there about gaming the system, which is called search engine optimization. It's going to happen in, in scientific communication. It's going to happen in archiving. All these things, once you get something out there that has these very strong metrics, people are going to game the system. Yep. And uh, I just want to um, dampen down the enthusiasm a little bit because we need to provide mechanisms for fighting back against gaming the system. These need to be <coughs> not layered on top of them, because uh, layered on top of the protocols because that's generally not that very effective. Yep. They need to be thought through and implemented actually in, in, in the underlying protocols. It's the big mistake we made with, with Google was this, <laughs> the fighting back against the search engine optimization is layered on top. Yeah, so uh, just a quick reaction. I very much um, agree, of course, with basically everything uh, you say, David. Um, I, however, find the good news that we come from an environment in which we had one a metric at our disposition, which was the impact factor, which could be gamed also, and actually has been abused to a very large extent in many different uh, kind of ways. And we're now moving to an environment where we have a whole range of metrics uh, available to us. In both cases, you need to use them with a grain of sand and be very uh, aware of the dangers that you know, are involved in, in uh, interpreting uh, these things. <clears throat> Another thing I'd like to add, and this is about the whole realm of altmetrics, is that from my perspective, it is a bit too early to kind of start to police them. I would love to see a lot more chaos initially in exploring uh, the consequences and the possibilities in that realm in order to maybe in a couple of years from now come to some kind of consequence, uh, consistent uh, new metrics that we could all agree on. And there will be a whole lot of debate uh, in that realm, I'm sure. That it? All right, well, thank you again for uh, your attention. Thanks. <laughs> With that, uh, I wish you uh, a good series of breakout sessions, and I'll see you all at the reception. Um, Herbert, thank you again. Um, we will send you back to your, um, uh, your desert and um, your vehicle, but um, really appreciate uh, you sharing your thinking with us on that. Thank you again.